Well, first of all, thank you very much for having me. It's an honor to be here. I mean, it's been, uh, it's really, it's really cool because I have an opportunity to, to tell you my story and, uh, you know, I appreciate the introduction. You've pretty much heard my story, so thank you. <laughs> uh, but uh, it's, it, it's, it's been a, yeah, there's a little more, it's a little more in detail, and that's kind of one thing that excites me is that, uh, is I don't, you know, most things, you know, you see the, the two-minute interview on NBC that uh, everybody, you know, the quick story about what I went through and my eye problem and overcoming that and then winning gold and, and whatnot. And then there's the, you know, other times I get to speak, it's the quick, you know, five to ten-minute version. Luckily, I have two hours tonight to tell you about everything, so it's going to be a good time. I really like this. Um, no, it doesn't, uh, it won't last that long, I promise. It's only about, uh, you know, 20 minutes, half an hour, but, uh, I'll, you know, it'll be, give you a little more insight to how things actually how things went down and, and a little more about my eye disease and then um, you know where I went from there and then to kind of finish, off, finish it off with some of the uh, you know some ethical things that uh, um, that I face as an athlete um, as a bobsledder specifically um, that a lot of people don't realize you know there's ethics in everything um, you always have to stay true to yourself and, and it's, it's very important and, and it'll, it'll hopefully open your eyes with some some different insight and maybe a different view on the way things go so um, let me Start. I'm pretty new to the whole PowerPoint thing, but uh, I kind of like this little format because I get to show a couple videos that explain things better than I can. I'm not an ophthalmologist, so trying to tell you what a keratoconus is is, is not very easy. Um, so, a little quick stats. You kind of went, went over it. Uh, I was born in Park City, Utah. Um, I, was, I grew up there. I lived there my, most of my life. Uh, my father still lives there, and I still live in his basement. Um, unfortunately, at 34 years old, but I don't typically tell people that. Um, uh, so I've been to three Olympic Games. I went to Torino in 06, was my first Olympics, Vancouver in 2010, and I just got back in February from Sochi. And um, see, I've got three Olympic medals, one gold, two bronze. Um, and then these are these are stats that I had no idea really were out there. I didn't realize the, the how, how long I've been doing this. Um, 16 years is a long time. I didn't. It goes by very quickly. I actually originally started doing bobsled. I was going to plan to do it from 1998 to 2002, and then move on to something bigger and better, and here I am, 16 years later, still doing it. Um, but uh, so I've won five, 10 world championship medals, five uh, gold, five bronze, and 54 World Cup medals, um, and 11 overall World Cup titles. And to me, it just, I, I can't believe it's, it's, it's very strange for me to say that. It just doesn't feel like that. But uh, it's been a pretty, pretty amazing career, and uh, I'm pretty thankful for everything that I've, that I've been blessed with. So. Um, there's me skiing. Started when I was two years old, Park City, Utah. Um, I grew up playing sports. I played every sport that I could. I played football, baseball, basketball, um, soccer. I ran track. Um, but my biggest passion was ski racing. I was an alpine ski racer for 10 years. Um, I, I competitively raced from about eight years old to 18 years old. And uh, I actually made it to the Western Regional Team, which is a pretty elite team. Unfortunately, when you're 18 years old, you don't, um, you're either on the national team at that point or you're not. And I kind of was, I was, you know, better than most, but not great. So I had to kind of uh, find something else to do. I think you know it was it was a hard transition. But uh, in 1998, right after the Nagano Olympics, uh, you know, in preparations for the 2002 Olympics in Salt Lake City, the U.S. bobsled team held an open tryout in Salt Lake City. I decided to check it out. I did really well and was invited to a camp. Um, I did really well at that second camp. Was invited to a third camp, and before you know it, here I am standing at the top of the hill in November um, for my first race. Um, that's me in the middle, little tiny, little tiny guy right there in the middle. Uh, those guys behind, next to me are gigantic human beings. Um, <laughs> it, I, I'm much bigger than I was then. I've actually gained about 50 pounds. Um, I haven't gained any height, unfortunately, but um, we'll work on that. I'm still working on that. I don't know how to do that part. Um, so I actually uh, was going to the University of Utah, and uh, when I got the call up to go to bobsled, um, kind of an interesting little side note. I uh, I begged, I, I, during my tryout process, I missed enrollment into the University of Utah. And um, going back, I didn't know if I'd made the team yet, so I begged the dean to let me in, and I took, so he, he, you know, took me weeks of begging and, and pleading, and he finally let me in. Um, about six weeks later, I made the national team, and I had to beg for him to let me go. Um, it was without getting any incompletes, and he's, you know, without, getting, without any failing and just getting incompletes, and it was actually a very difficult process. Um, but I ended up dropping out of college just, I, sorry, withdrew from college. Um, I'm, I'm back in college. Um, but uh, it, it was just something, you know, it's school will always be there, and thankfully it still is. Um, and so I, I went on, on my journey. Um, I started bobsledding. I was actually a push athlete for four years. I didn't drive the entire time. And as I mentioned, you know, my goal was to go to the Olympic Games in my hometown 
and you know have a great story and then move on from there to a bigger, better life. I, I didn't really know what I was doing. I was you know, 18 at the time. Um, but one week before the Olympic trials, I got cut. Um, and unfortunately for, you know, it was kind of one of those decisions that I'll talk about a little later, um, choosing teams. But um, there really was no reason. Um, basically, a, a former athlete that competed in Nagano um, decided to come back uh, the week of the Olympic trials and said, hey, um, I'm a former Olympian. I'm pretty good. I think I could do better than, than he could. And so my driver said, okay, you're done. Sorry. Um, picking up a new guy. So, you know, my dreams right there thrown out the window pretty quickly. It was very unfortunate, but, you know, I wouldn't be here if it didn't happen. So I can't be too upset about it, I guess. Uh, so at that moment, once I was cut, I decided I am not, you know, I'm putting putting my career into my own hands. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take over, I'm going to drive, and I'm not going to look back. I'm going to be the driver. I'm going to be one making decisions. I'm not going to let anybody dictate what I'm doing anymore. And that's kind of what I became passionate about, about bobsledding. Um, and then uh, that's about the same time that I was diagnosed with what I, what my degenerative eye disease, keratoconus. Um, during that time, it was, uh, you know, keratoconus back then, I mean, it was, well, as much as I say back then, it was, you know, 16 years ago, it was very hard to diagnose, and I think uh, they believed that I had it for a lot longer. Um, however, um, it's not something that was easily diagnosed. And then the problem was, or, so they said, well, you know, it's this eye disease, degenerative eye disease. It's no, not something to worry about. You know, your vision's 20, 30. You'll end up having to get a cornea transplant, but that'll be 30 to 40 years down the road. You don't have to worry about it. Nothing's in jeopardy. Don't even let it phase you. Um, so it wasn't really a big, big deal, but kind of at the same time, as I was just learning how to drive, that's kind of the time my eyes started degenerating. So that's when I was learning how to you know, use the sense of feel instead of the sense of, instead of visual cues of driving, um, which, you know, there's a, a lot of experts that say that best drivers drive by feel and not by, not by vision. So, it was kind of fortunate yet unfortunate that I was losing my vision. It was making me a better bobsledder, but it was, I was losing my vision. So um, here is actually, let's see if I can get this to play from here. Um, this is a video, this just kind of explains what keratoconus is, hoping it plays. Oh, he's got it. Keratoconus is a degenerative disease of the cornea, which is the outer lens of the eye, which is the windshield of your car. And the problem with it is that it's weak, specifically the collagen is weak, so it can't hold that nice round shape anymore. Therefore, the cornea starts to bulge out uncontrollably. It can cause a tremendous amount of distortion, such as blurred vision, double, triple vision, multiple images, glaring halos at night, and it can rob the person of the ability to lead a normal life. So that's, uh, that's Dr. Brian Boxer Walker. He's actually the, the, uh, the doctor that I found, eventually found that did my surgery. Um, and he's just really good at explaining it because that's what he does for a living. So I'd rather he explain it to you than me try to explain what keratoconus is. But essentially it's just your, your tissue is weak and it, the pressure in your eye causes it to bulge out and you go blind. Um, and it's, it's, it's a miserable feeling. Um, so <clears throat> um, the problem was I had, you know, I kept all this vision problem a secret. I didn't tell anybody. Um, you know, it, was, it was a very, it was my dirty little secret. Um, it was, it, my vision, when I first was diagnosed in 2001, my vision was 2030, and I was, had uh, contact lenses that corrected in 2020, no big deal. By 2005, 2006, it was down to about 2080. Um, and I was getting new contact lenses every six months, and then it was going down to every four weeks, and then it was every couple of weeks I had to get new contact lenses. And nobody really knew how bad it was. I kept, I was very good at keeping it a secret. Um, I was just, I, I withdrew from society, withdrew from my friends, family, teammates, and just played it off like I was the dedicated athlete. You know, they go out to the sports bar to watch, you know, the, the football game, and I'd be like, oh, no, I, I you know, I'm, I'll stay here and, and you know, hang out at the house, but realistically, I just, because I couldn't see, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't go hang out because I couldn't see the score, I couldn't, I couldn't see people I was talking to, um, it was a very challenging time, and, uh, you know, again, you know, kind of the silver lining, because I was losing my vision, I was learning how to drive by feel, and uh, starting to, to kind of come into my own as a driver, and beating athletes that had been around for considerably longer than I, I had been around. So this is kind of what keratoconus looks like. 
from your uh, from my perspective, I guess you could say. The top left, it, it kind of explains the uh, the double and triple vision. If you look at the arrow, there's double, but if in the, kind of above it, there's a triple. Um, that's kind of the beginning of it. That's what you're seeing. Uh, this is the, the road is more of like at night. This is kind of how you see things. And then uh, below it is kind of a combination of everything. And that's kind of where, where my vision was going. And that's how I live my life. I couldn't go, to the, couldn't go out and get a hot sandwich because I couldn't order it. So it was very challenging. Um, <clears throat> so in uh, 2007, this is a big year for me. Um, I just made my first Olympic team. I made the Torino Olympics, and I ended up having the best finish of any U.S. Uh, American uh, male bobsledder. Um, I finished sixth. Uh, I wasn't even supposed to um, do that well. In fact, I, I did have odds on me. It was 25,000 to one that I would win a medal, um, which is kind of cool and strange. That, I don't know if it's insulting at the same time, but um, but yeah. So I didn't win, so nobody. I don't think anybody bet on me. It's a pretty long shot, but. Uh, it was kind of cool to just to come away as the as a number one driver after my first Olympics. Um, 2006 uh, was considered to be one of the most successful bobsled seasons ever in history. Uh, we ended up winning um, not only the first ever overall World Cup title in two man, um, but we were the first. We was the first driver to ever win a two man and four man and the combined all in one season, or win a medal. I got second in the four man, um, but uh, it, no no other driver in history had ever done this. So it was kind of a breakthrough moment. Uh, the problem was my vision was now approaching 21,000. <clears> and because of all this, my withdrawal from society, my friends, family, I was slipping into a pretty, pretty deep depression, and it was uh, starting to over, overcome my life. I thought I, was, I, was, I thought I was tough. I thought I could fight it out. I could handle myself. I mean, I'm a, you know, I spent seven years in the military. You know, I, I'm an Olympic bobsledder, and I consider myself to be a pretty tough guy. And, uh, and then in June, that's when I kind of came out to my coach and said, look, that I... It's becoming too dangerous. I can't see, and I, I have to retire. And he's like, "Oh no, you'll be fine. We'll just we'll get you some contacts." I'm like, eh, "I don't think I've been keeping this a secret. It's really, really bad. I can't see." He's like, "No, well, don't worry about it. We'll figure something out." I'm like, "Yeah, I've seen 12 specialists. I, I, it's just not going to work." He's like, "Well, just hold your horse before you retire. Yeah, we'll figure something out." So I said, "Okay," um, but it, it wasn't really okay, unfortunately. Um, so, you know, as I mentioned, I slipped into a, a very deep depression. I started feeling it I, from what I can remember around 2004. You know, I just, as I was starting to withdraw from friends and family, I just wasn't socializing and I wasn't able to, you know, you know, maintain friendships and just, it was a very difficult life, a very isolated life. And then on top of that, you know, you know I, was, I was living in like a six foot bubble. I couldn't see more than six feet away and it was very challenging. And like I said, I, I just, you know, I was keeping it a secret. I was lying to people. I was lying to sponsors. We just had the greatest season in bobsled history. Then everybody, the USOC is throwing all this money at us because we're going to be the next greatest thing in bobsled. And I'm like, yes, this is awesome. But I, you know, they, little do they know where I was actually headed. And it was very, very challenging. It's something that really, really, really dug deep. And uh, it was very difficult. Not to mention my Olympic dreams. I, I'd wanted to be an Olympian since I was five years old. And you know, seeing, realizing my dream was over was very, very difficult. And not to mention just, sorry. <clears throat> just living a normal life. Um, oh, so... <clears throat> It's always the hardest part. I tried, tried to kill myself in 2007. Um, it was just too much. I couldn't handle it. It over, overtook me. I thought I was tough. I didn't get help. I didn't ask anybody for help. And I just I tried to end it. And luckily, it didn't work, um, obviously. Um, but. It was something that was the moment that I realized that, you know, I ended up, I, I swallowed 73 sleeping pills, followed by a, basically a liter of Jack Daniels, and it didn't, obviously didn't work out, but the next morning when I woke up, I realized, you know, it wasn't my time. I had a bigger purpose. So that's when I realized I need to get help. I need to find, figure out what to do, get back on my horse, and get after it. 
So luckily, <clears throat> later about October, um, November, um, my coach came to me and said, hey, we found this guy in Beverly Hills who does this experimental procedure. It's called C3R. Um, his name's Dr. Brian Boxer Walkler, and it's gonna be, it's, it's gonna fix your vision. And again, I'm like, look, I've seen 12 specialists. I've been dealing with this for you know, six or seven years. It's, I've been through it all. And I actually, I actually went to do this procedure kind of to, just to say, you know, I told you so. Like, I, I've been through all this stuff. Uh, but I really had nothing to lose. If it didn't work, then I'm no better off than I was. But if it did work, then I'm back in the game and I'm ready to go and we're back in. So we'll get on to the next one. So the, the two procedures I ended up having was called, were called the Holcomb C3R. Um, it's still considered an experimental procedure because it's not FDA approved. Um, but to kind of get in that, because it's, it uses light, uh, UV light and riboflavin, which is uh, vitamin B2, I believe. Um, and they, hit the, they drop the, uh, the riboflavin in your eyes, hit it with the UV light, and it strengthens the cornea. Um, and it's, it's considered experimental because riboflavin isn't approved by the FDA to fix eyes. Um, it's, it's, it's a vitamin. So um, that's why it's considered experimental. Um, it's kind of like using aspirin for a heart attack. Um, aspirin's not meant to stop heart, atta heart attacks or, or, or you know, help prevent it, but people use it that way. That's not the FDA approval. So that's where kind of the, uh, the, the, the non-FDA approved comes in. And uh, you know, Holcomb C3R, I'll, I'll get into that in a second. Um, and then the Visian ICL, which is an insertable contact lens. Um, basically, it's a contact lens that's been inserted in my eye. Um, and I have actually two videos that kind of explain it. It's kind of cool. I just like showing it because it's, it's kind of cool. Um, it's not gross. It won't gross you out or anything. It's <laughs> computer generated, so they won't be stabbing eyes and stuff. Um, uh, but yeah, so the, the, the lens is basically implanted in my eye. It's tucked behind my iris, and then uh, I, I walk around without contacts, and it's awesome. So I'll, I actually have another video. I'll start it. Hopefully, well, this is the one. All right, this is the one you have to exit out. It should be the milk right there in the media player already. Oh. Boom. Yeah. Up till recently, the traditional treatment for keratonus was an invasive and painful cornea transplant. So that had been what most doctors still today believe as the treatment for keratonus when in fact we have something else that's less invasive and much easier for patients to recover from. The procedure that I came up with involves strengthening the cornea non-surgically using vitamin applications and light. And the two interact together to strengthen the cornea and that's how we can stop keratoconus right in its tracks. A lot of the original research for the Holcomb C3R procedure came from dermatology actually because that involves natural cross-linking in the skin. What we did is then we applied it to the eye, to the cornea specifically, to strengthen the cornea because we know that cross-linking in the cornea is actually the key to making it strong again. And how is the Holcomb procedure performed? The Holcomb C3R procedure is non-surgical and we use vitamin application with light and it's a 30 minute procedure. So patients are literally, they're sitting in a big cushy lounge chair here in our office as if they were going to be watching something on TV. And after the 30 minute procedure, they go home, we see them the next day and then they have fully recovered from the procedure. What we found is that the Holcomb C3R procedure has been so exciting for patients because in the past they were feeling dreaded that they'd have to go down the path of a cornea transplant. So we've taken them from going down that path and now with a non-invasive procedure in just 30 minutes we can stop keratoconus in its tracks. So this is a huge, huge advancement for the field. The treatment for keratoconus is named after Olympian Steve Holt. After Steve Holcomb had this miraculous comeback with the Olympics, when he went from virtually retiring from his beloved sport of bobsledding to then winning an Olympic gold medal at the 2010 Winter Olympics in Vancouver, was just almost a miracle in itself. When Steve was basically legally blind from keratoconus, he didn't feel it was safe to drive anymore, really for the safety of the three guys behind him. He didn't want to have something terrible happen and have that on his you know, shoulders, so to speak. So that's why he was really set to retire from the sport. He went to 10 other eye doctors and everyone recommended a cornea transplant. But his team and his team doctor didn't want to accept that. They knew there had to be something else. And that's when they actually found me and the C3R procedure that I've been doing for keratoconus. After that, because Steve had 
really been so vocal about letting patients know, people know, that there is something aside from an invasive and painful cornea transplant using the C3R procedure. What I decided to do, and I approached Steve with this beforehand and explained I'd really love to honor him by renaming the procedure Holcomb C3R because he has been so powerful to let people know worldwide about this alternative treatment to cornea transplants. So that's pretty cool. Um, so that's a little why, why it's called Holcomb C3R. It was quite an honor to be, you know, have a, a procedure, a, a procedure named after you. It's just an incredible. Um, oh, did you close it? Yeah. <laughs> Computer science major, I'm hacking the system. Um, actually, you're good. I can go for it. Oh, oh. actually, you got to push it one more time. Yeah. So this is the second part. The visiting eyes. So this is more cool one, I think. Yeah, the 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 the. Uh, Vitamins in the eyes, cool. Shaping the cornea, like LASIK <clears throat> and PRK, Vizian ICL uses lens technology to deliver sharp, clear vision. First, anesthetic eye drops will be used to numb the eye. Next, the Vizian ICL is folded and gently placed in the eye through a tiny opening. Then, the lens naturally unfolds and the doctor will gently tuck the edges of the lens under the iris. With the Vizian ICL, high definition vision can be achieved, even for patients with severe nearsightedness, and recovery usually occurs quickly. LASIK, PRK, and the Vizian ICL procedure can provide excellent visual results for those who qualify. LASIK and the Vizian ICL provide immediate vision improvement after the procedure, often referred to as the wow moment. The LASIK and Vizian ICL procedures are short and provide relatively quick visual recovery. The Vizian ICL is designed to be permanent, however, it can be removed or replaced if your vision dramatically changes. It protects the eyes from harmful UV rays and does not remove tissue from your cornea, leaving more treatment options available as you age. So, all right, I can go, I think. Oops. Did I do that again? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's all right. Boom, 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 got it, cool. So I just like showing that, I'm sorry if it grossed anybody out. I just think it's really cool, like they have contact lenses inside my eye. Um, but I, I literally went uh, 21,000 to 2020 in about 30 minutes. Um, so it's pretty impressive. <clears throat> so here's a little timeline of the way things progressed after I had my vision restored. Um, I, was, I had the procedures done March 6, 2008, um, almost to the year to the day. Uh, a year to the day, um, I won the first world championship title in 50 years for the United States. Uh, almost two years, we won the first Olympic gold medal in 62 years. Uh, four years, the first American to ever sweep the world championships. And then six years, uh, the first American to win two man Olympic medal in 62 years. And then the first American to win two medals at the same time, not to mention become home the most successful U.S. Olympian. So that's uh, a pretty cool little <laughs> progression. Right? Thank you. Um, so now that's kind of my story. You heard the, the cool stuff, um, but uh, I do want to talk. You know, the, the, this is an, eth an ethics kind of group, and this is you know funded by you know the Daniels Fund, and this is where we want to talk about the ethical part of bobsledding. And it's really there's a lot of things in it, things about sport that you don't really realize. Um, for one, you know, track safety and exposure to the track. You know, we all know that a, an athlete was killed in Vancouver. Um, Performance enhancing, uh, performance enhancing, enhancement, anti-doping, uh, which is like taking steroids and whatnot, um, and then borrowing and renting equipment. That was a big ordeal at the, this past Olympics. Um, so the first one, oh, this is kind of cool. Sorry, no more videos. I can, I can get it. You can make it feel bad. Um, so this is, this is kind of fun. This is, this is more. This is actually, the, uh, this is a. Well, I'll show. I'll, here's a second. Just give me two seconds. Um, so this is actually a, a POV, a point of view of the track in Sochi. Um, this is during a training. Um, I cut it out because this is, we actually, you're not allowed to have electronics on the sled. 
um, but they were being really mean. Um, so we ended up sneaking a camera on the sled. Um, that's why the, this, this is my teammate. He's kneeling down, trying to hide the camera. Um, and if that's at the front of the sled, there's a pin that we move the sleds around with. And um, nobody knew that we had this camera on. And uh, this first video is going to be what, uh, what it looks like going down the Sochi track. It's pretty cool. Um, the second video right after it um, shows what my vision was like and what, be like what it was like driving with my vision the way it was. And it was very, it's very weird to look back on it, but it's, it's kind of cool. So. <laughs> So the top speed there was 85, just over 85 miles an hour. It's kind of hard to see, but it, if you saw the people standing on the side, they're going pretty, pretty fast. So this next video shows what it was like when I was learning how to drive. Same track. <laughs> So needless to say, visual cues would not work well. Um, but uh, you know, that was, that was really what it was like driving. You really learned to drive by your feel. Like I learned over time what each track was like, how long the curves were. I mean, we know these tracks very well. Every driver in the world does. And you just learn how to, to get down them. You go down so many times, you just learn how to get down it without really having to see. And I just didn't use my eyes. And it, uh, it is kind of weird because I, I, I do, as I watch these, these videos over and over, it, does, it reminds me of the times when I, I couldn't see what was going on. And it's just uh, very uh, strange to watch. That it, it even like, it blows my mind. I'm like, hmm, how did I do that? Um, so anyways, so my, you know, I decided to, coming to track safety and exposure, you know, as uh, one of my issues with coming clean about my vision is my vision got so bad that I was now concerned about my state, the safety of my athletes. And it's one of those situations where you have to put, you have to make a decision. Do I want my, to progress my career? Or do I have to put the safety of my team in front of me, ahead of me? And uh, it was just a decision that I decided 
um, to, to make. Uh, luckily, we were successful when I had that, the, my vision problem, so they don't really hate me too much, knowing now what my vision was, because I didn't really tell them, they didn't know until after the fact, and now they're like, really? I, you know, I wouldn't have gotten in the sled with myself. Uh, so now that they're, they, they, they're, you know, we, were, we won a number of medals, and so they're okay with it, I guess, but uh, they don't hate me too much. But uh, it, like I said, it is uh, something you have to be you know, straight up with yourself and honest, and, and you have to put yourself, you know, other people ahead of yourself sometimes. Um, well, not, a lot of times, actually. Um, another reason, Vancouver. Um, the Canadians and the Russians both, they, um, they decided they were going to dominate the track. Um, they, were, they cut off any runs from any, from any other competitors. Um, Canada, Vancouver said, hey, uh, we've got this new, new program called Own the Podium, and no foreign athlete will be allowed on any of our venues until the Olympic Games. And it kind of backfired with them. Um, the luge athlete was killed on the opening, the, the day of the opening ceremonies in Vancouver. Um, and they, you know, they blamed him for lack of experience, but a lot of it was lack of time on the track. I mean, we just didn't have enough runs on the track. And it was, it's the fastest, most dangerous track in the world. And to hold off that kind of uh, training is just not, is just not a, the right thing to do, especially when you know, people's lives are in danger. I mean, bobsledding and luge uh, are very dangerous sports. Um, you know, Sochi, we, Sochi's the same way. You know, it, it, it's a lot of issues with being able to get down the track. The Russians had over 400 runs going into the Olympic Games. We, I had 40. Um, I was only allowed 40, um, and that's the minimum that they've given us to take down the track. I'm literally at the Olympic Games waiting around in the Olympic Village waiting while the Russians go train on the track. Like, they just, that's just not a fair, fair fight, and a lot of us are trying to, to get that change. I mean, that's just not a, no, the right way to, to run things. I mean, it's not a, the Olympic Games are about fairness and being you know, e equal across the board, and it just wasn't that way. Um, so needless to say, they, they swept the races and they were dominant um, across the board. So that was a very challenging um, issue. Um, another one, um, anti-doping, um, performance enhancing. Believe it or not, after the run in Vancouver, um, there were two protests filed against me for winning the gold medal. Um, the first um, was that I had the performance enhancing procedure done. Um, I had my eyes fixed, and so that was, that was, that was a no-go. You can't do that. Um, so you saw what my vision was before. I mean, I'm just trying to level the playing field here. Um, so they, they were really upset about that, and it gave me an unfair advantage that I could see now. Um, so they were, you know, they, were, they were throwing out everything they could to try to, to get me disqualified. Uh, needless to say, um, that uh, it didn't, there's no, there's, it's not a banned procedure. Like there are procedures, surgical procedures you can do that are banned, but this is not one of them, and that, that's really not a very good excuse. Um, so they threw that one out. The second one was that they, because I use riboflavin, um, that's not a vitamin that, the, the way it was administered through eye drops and then UV lighting, that's not a, uh, that's not a legal way of delivery. Um, so they really tried hard. I mean, they're pulling all, all the stops. I mean, I'm not sure B2 in my eyes are really going to give me a whole lot of advantage. Um, but uh, so they, they, again, they didn't really violate any rules. Um, so that, uh, it's always a very sensitive subject. Um, another one that's, uh, that, that blows my mind um, is um, in 2002, we had an American athlete test positive. And, uh, and also, at the same time, a Latvian ath athlete, Sandus Prusis. Um, Pavli Jovan, I think it was the American. I know it doesn't sound very American, but he's Serbian, uh, but he's an American. But uh, Sandus Prusis, they both tested positive for the exact same um, substance, both, and it was banned. It was, you, you can't take it, period. Um, and uh, Pavle, the American, was banned for two years and kicked out of the Olympics, and the Latvian was allowed to compete. And the, and the Latvian actually had more in his system. So it's really kind of, it's just it's a strange situation, something that we face on a daily basis. You know, how do you what, do you, what do you do in that kind of situation? Do you really, I mean, do you, how do you ban one person, not the other? I mean, it's really strange how it happened, and uh, I don't know, it's really. Um, 2014, there were eight positive tests. Um, and majority of those actually came from the exact same st stimulant that was found in a Russian energy drink. These guys just went down uh, to the local grocery store, bought an energy drink right off the shelf, drank it, and it had a banned substance in it. And actually, the, the substance that's banned that they were banned for is found in drinks in the United States. Uh, so it's not it's not something that's you know crazy going to make you you know your hair fall out or anything, but it's just a, a stimulant that, that stimulates you more than it should. And, and um, so it's just really, it's a very like black and white, it should, or it's very gray, you know, area. It's, I mean, none of those guys, you know, they all, the, the two bobsledders that were banned finished 27th and 18th. It's not like they really gave them a huge advantage. 
but and I know for a fact, I know these guys very well. I've, I live with them for six months a year. They didn't do it on purpose. But you know, regardless, you have to do the same thing. And it's just one of those situations that you have to, you, you have to, to ban people no matter what. Um, and and you, unfortunately, it was a bad situation. And maybe give them a little leeway, maybe not a two-year ban, but I think it comes down to each individual uh, test. So it's, uh, you know, anti-doping is always a sensitive subject, especially when it comes to like ethics and just, you know, is it ethical to take something? I mean, is it, is it okay to take protein? I mean, I take a protein supplement, but I'd rather take a protein shake than nine, nine chicken breasts. I mean, the chicken was great tonight, but nine of them might have been a little excessive. You might have thought pretty, I was pretty weird if I was eating nine of them. Um, so yeah, it's just a very kind of gray area that seems like it should be black and white. You either do or you don't. But it, you know, people, you, you got to stay true to yourself and true to the sport, and you got to draw the line somewhere. Um, so this is another big one. I don't know if a lot of anybody, anybody heard, but um, the Russian driver that won both the two-man and the four-man race, um, he actually rented equipment from a German who didn't qualify for the Olympics. So that kind of raises an, an ethical question of like, so now he rented, a, he rented this set of runners, which are the runners of the blades on the bottom. He rented one set for 30 grand for two days. I mean, that's a lot of money for two days of racing um, that no other country can afford. I couldn't afford it. I actually, the guy came to me and offered them to me, and I was like, I don't have 30 grand to drop for two days of racing. Um, I guess I should have. I would have maybe won, but um, <laughs> but it, it, I mean it's not fair to like you know the, the smaller nations like the Jamaicans. They can't afford thirty grand. Um, you know they can't. You know they, they can hardly pay their way over there, let alone rent thirty thousand dollars worth of equipment. How are they supposed to compete against a big nation that that has money to throw around? I mean they've spent fifty billion dollars on the the Olympics alone. Um, so it's just kind of one of those unfair advantages that we have to deal with. I mean it's not. You know, where do you draw the line? I mean, yeah, it should be even across the board, but realistically, it's not. I mean, it comes down to who's got the most money and who's got the best connections, which I guess in a lot of ways, that's how life works. But um, And then um, there was even a situation where an American athlete uh, was trading, American male was trading with a, fem a German female athlete. Um, she had access to a set of four-man runners. Women don't do four-man, um, but he had a really fast set of two man. So he let her use the four, uh, let, sorry, he let her use his runners in exchange for him borrowing a set from another German. And he, I mean, and when it comes to this, this like business type of, uh, of, of borrowing and renting equipment, it really does come down to like, you know, he's just doing everything he can to qualify for the Olympic Games. I mean, we're all volunteers. We don't get paid to do what we do. We need, I mean, our entire goal is to go to the Olympic Games. If I, if I have an opportunity to, to get a set of runners in exchange for another set of runners, then I'm going to take it. And so you know, when it came down to it, the Olympic Games, it was kind of an issue because the German was one of the top competitors versus an Ameri two American, three American girls. And um, you know, an American guy was giving the, the American girls' biggest competition his runners. And so it's kind of, it's one of those gray areas again, like, what do you do? I mean, it's just, it's a business transaction that happens every time, every day. The German and the Russian did it. I did it for a couple races uh, earlier in the season. I mean, it's really, it, it, but it comes down to, are you going against your team? Or are you just trying to benefit yourself? Are you trying to benefit the United States by trying to qualify yourself? I mean, it's really, it, it's a very challenging, challenging way to go about it. Um, and I, I don't actually have a slide for the next one. Oh, thank you. Um, but... Uh, Another one is, is choosing teams. I mean, picking a team. I was, I was cut from a team just because, because I, I don't know. I wasn't a very good politician. I couldn't defend myself. I don't know. Um, but I was replaced by an older athlete. I was only 21 at the time. The other athlete was 30, uh, 30, 31. Um, and he'd been to the Olympics, but he hadn't been competing until that point. So it was really, you know, at that point, he just dropped me and picked up the other guy. I mean, that's just not really a, a fair system. And that didn't really stand by the the way that it should have been run. Um, but at the same time, you know, I deal with these, these kinds of decisions every day. You know, I, I, this season in particular, I had a four-man crew that I'd been with for four years since the Olympics. And then one of the guys didn't train hard enough and wasn't really in shape at the time. And um, there was another guy, a fifth guy, that was in great shape, and he was number two in the country. And I, I, I hate breaking up my team, but I had to give the spot to the better athlete. And it's something that's, you know, it's a bit of perspective. It's kind of like what the, other, the first one, act with honesty in all situations. I mean, you, you, have to be, you have to be fair and you have to be true to yourself. You know, 
he wasn't in shape and I had to replace him. And you know, it depends on which side of, you're looking at. He didn't like it. He didn't think it was a very good decision. But at the same time, this other guy earned it. So you had to you know, not only be honest with your decisions and stick with them. Um, where is it on the bottom there? But um, you, have to, you have to stand by your word. Um, you know, I made a decision, and it worked out. I won two bronze and a gold, and, and we ended up uh, coming away. So, you know, there's all sorts of different uh, aspects of bobsledding that, a lot of, if you guys want to talk about it, I'm, I can talk all night. Uh, but uh, before I keep you too long, um, if, yeah, I mean, thank you very much. And uh, if you guys have any questions, I'm more than happy to answer bobsledding questions or Olympics or Sochi. Yes, sir. When the games were in Salt Lake, how much access did other teams have? Um, we actually, it, like, we, it was open to everybody. Um, this whole keeping the uh, track to, to ourselves um, started in Vancouver. Uh, that was the first time. So we're cool. <laughs> Um, yeah, the question is if I had um, headaches and migraines. Um, I didn't actually because my both my eyes um, were were equally as bad, um, so I didn't have that. They weren't fighting each other, which is oftentimes why people get headaches. Um, um, at least I don't remember. I didn't have anything debilitating, fortunately. Yes, sir. Um, well, it was more, you know, I, as when I attempted suicide and it didn't work, and I woke up the next day and it didn't take me, hit me for a couple days. Um, you know, it, it's something that, you know, I decided that this was nobody knew about it, and it was going to stay between myself and God, and that was it, and it would never get out to anybody. Um, but I realized, you know, what I had done should have worked, and there was no reason it shouldn't have, and that was kind of my motivation right there. That I realized I have a bigger purpose. There's something else that I'm here to do, and obviously I wouldn't have accomplish what I did without, you know, had I, gone, had I gotten, fully gone through with what, what was taking my life. And so um, from then on, you know, I, I try to, you know, talk to people and help people realize, like, you know, there is hope. And like, like I said, I, w I took the easy way out and it didn't work. And I'm fortunate and I had a great career afterwards, but I wouldn't have had I really done it right. You know, so that's, uh, that's something that, uh, you know, hopefully I can convey to people. Yes, sir. Yeah. How come you wouldn't go and get help? You said you didn't want to get help. Well, okay. So I didn't want to get help. Like depression. It was the depression that I was. I didn't. I thought I could fight through it. I thought I was tough, and I can. Like I look. I'm, I'm mentally tough. I, I mean, I do this for a living. I'm strong. You know, I can do this. I can get through this. And it's it's, it's you know tough times don't last. Tough people do. You know, it's. Uh, you know, but it, it, it's something that you kind of spiral and it gets out of control and then you just can't recover and it, it, it becomes a chemical imbalance in your brain and you just can't, you can't get out of it and you need, to, you need help you need from an outside source. Um, as for the vision, I, I did seek out uh, 12 different um, op, uh, cornea specialists throughout the, the four or five years um, and every single one of them just said there's only one option that's a cornea transplant. And the cornea transplant would have ended up um, you can only do one eye at a time. It takes you out between six months and a year. Um, on top of that, your, your corneas become fragile. Um, if you hit your head too hard, it could jar them loose. Um, and then on top of that, uh, you know, I'd have to take a year off from the sport for each eye, and that would just take me out of the sport. And then, you know, then anti-rejection drugs, um, you know, constant maintenance, and then it doesn't even cure it. In a few, you know, 10 to 15 years later, you have to get another cornea transplant. So it's just a bad cycle. And so that was kind of my, that was my only option, and I just didn't, I didn't go through with it because I didn't, I didn't want to deal with. That wasn't what I wanted. I'm sorry. Um, so far, so good. Um, I mean, like I said, it's still somewhat experimental. It's still brand new, but at the same time, I, I'm going on year six, um, and everything's still great. Um, so yeah, there's a chance, um, and and sometimes you know it doesn't. Procedures like this don't work for everybody all the time, um, but you know it, they, they found that if you have it done once, you know you can even go back and have it done a second or third time, and it will it'll make them even stronger. Um, so hopefully, I mean, right, as of right now, um, everything's good to go. What's kind of cool is the the implantable contact lens. If my eyes do start to get um, start to go bad, I can actually change out the lens and, and have a new one. So it's kind of cool. How much longer do you think 
Um, how much longer in the sport? I'm not really sure. Um, four years is a long time. Um, I'd like to go to Korea. Um, but at the same time, I'm still recovering from Sochi. That was kind of a long, a long haul. Um, but uh, it's been good. I, I mean, I love what I do. I'm good at it. And uh, I don't know. I don't see why I didn't retire yet. But uh, the, the Russian that, that won double gold, he was 39 years old. So um, I'll be two years younger than he was at the next Olympics. So that gives me hope right there. I'm pretty excited that uh, you know, I can maintain, if I can maintain my, my health and you know, I can, we can go win double gold. Yes, ma'am. It's all good. Um, do you know why they're not letting you do videos in the bobsled? Um, well, uh, yeah, it's uh, because of cheating. Um, and there's no electronics on the sled whatsoever. There's very creative ways to make the sled faster um, using electronics. Um, so like the, the blades that you run on, um, the runners, they, they have found people with, um, they, if they heat up, you go really fast. And so just by eliminating any electronics whatsoever on the sled, it eliminates any chance of trying to electronically heat up the runners or, or change the sled in some way. I mean, if, if you're going faster, you can actually you know, manipulate the sled so it, it moves. Um, and there's all sorts of different ways. And so it just, it's, more, it's kind of a rule across the board, no electronics. Um, but we sneak stuff on sometimes. But don't tell anybody. They're just being mean, so I don't know. Cool. Thank you.